Hello, and good evening. I've had a lot of ideas lately, and so I'm just going to talk about them in this video. I might end up talking about a lot of different things. So I'd like to start with a word called inference. Inference is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. I don't want to go too quickly. So an inference is a conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning. I mentioned that word, inference, because it's contained in the next definition that I really wanted to provide. And that is the definition for circumstantial evidence. Now, I'm not trying to come off as some type of legal expert. I'm not. But I just wanted to drop this idea of circumstantial evidence because it's already a defined concept and it's used in courts, both civil courts and criminal courts. I don't want to give an explanation of the different types of court systems or different types of law. In Canada, we have a mixture of statutory law and precedent law, which they call case law. There's different burdens of proof to convict someone in a criminal court as opposed to civil law, which deals with property and damages, and the burden of proof of making a judgment is lower than that of criminal law. But actually, this concept of circumstantial evidence, which I will try and elaborate, actually comes up in both civil and criminal law. Okay, so first I provided this definition of what an inference is. A conclusion reached on the basis of evidence and reasoning process of inferring something. Okay, so this idea of an inference is also contained in the definition of circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is evidence that relies on an inference to connect it to a conclusion of fact, such as a fingerprint at the scene of a crime. By contrast, direct evidence supports the truth of an assertion directly i.e. without need for any additional evidence or inference. So circumstantial evidence is different than direct evidence and examples of direct evidence are a witness who testifies, so someone speaking in court or perhaps a photograph or a video of something happening and I think that direct evidence is probably associated with evidence that is almost beyond a reasonable doubt although even that seems to be debatable within this Wikipedia article on circumstantial evidence. Now I'm not going to read the whole thing. I risk boring everybody, but I did just want to read the first sentence of this paragraph. Okay, so the first sentence here says, a popular misconception is that circumstantial evidence is less valid or less important than direct evidence. This is only partly true Direct evidence is popularly assumed to be the most powerful. Many successful criminal prosecutors rely largely or entirely on circumstantial evidence and civil charges are frequently based on circumstantial or indirect evidence. So, long story short, they're basically saying even in a court, criminal or civil, where a judge comes to a decision, it doesn't necessarily mean a decision is less valid because the decision was arrived at through circumstantial evidence. Okay, so I went to a website. I cut off the link, but it's legaldictionary.net and I just wanted to find an example of circumstantial evidence just to prove my point. So here's an example. In this case it's a criminal example. Unfortunately it's kind of gruesome. For example, Mary testifies in court that she saw Robert standing over a man with a bloody knife in his hand, Mary did not see Robert stab the victim, so she can only testify and describe what she saw. This circumstantial evidence is likely not enough by itself to convict Robert, so the prosecution provides other evidence which, when added to Mary's testimony, leads the jury to the conclusion that Robert stabbed the victim. There's a few more examples of circumstantial evidence. I suppose you could pause and read the screen. I'm not going to read them. My only point 
in mentioning this is to present this concept of circumstantial evidence and a distinction between circumstantial evidence and direct evidence. I think it is important when trying to present an argument for the mud flood or cultural layer or whatever you want to describe this phenomenon of soil inundation on old buildings. My point is this. Well, I'll phrase it as a question. Is there evidence that a mass inundation of mud buried and covered old cities? My answer is yes. I think there is circumstantial evidence which shows that a lot of the old Greco-Roman style architecture and ancient buildings have circumstantial evidence which would suggest that they were flooded sometime in the past. Do we have direct evidence of this? Direct evidence might be pictures, videos, even people's eyewitness testimony that they saw the buildings being flooded with mud. I think that would actually fall under the category of direct evidence. Direct evidence is you actually saw this happen. You didn't just see somebody holding a bloody knife, you saw them stab somebody else. Sorry for the awful comparison, but if you actually saw somebody, eyewitness testimony with your own eyes, commit a crime, or if you saw the mud flood happen before your eyes and wrote a book about it and testified in court under oath, then to me that's direct evidence. My point is, I don't think we have direct evidence of the mud flood, but there is certainly circumstantial evidence that this has taken place. Okay, so once again, I've tried to explain what circumstantial evidence is, and I've tried to give a distinction between circumstantial evidence and direct evidence, and what those two terms mean. Because now, I'd like to talk about a video that came out recently, which was accusing mud flood of being a hoax, or PSYOP, or psychological operation. This is the video here, it's by a channel called The Mad Dr. S Show. Now right away I want to emphasize that I'm not trying to attack this gentleman's personal character or his ideas or put him down simply because he's taking an opposite viewpoint as to the ones I've expressed on my channel about mud flood. But what I will take aim at is that I don't think Dr. S is providing a logical argument against the mud flood. And I'm going to try to show this by taking a look at his video. So he has this title to his video called Operation Mud Flood, Destabilize, Demoralize, and Divert. So I think it's fair to assume that Dr. S thinks that the mud flood is really a movement to divert your attention and provide misinformation from the real truth. In his video, he begins by providing a definition for psychological operations. Then he goes on to define what a red herring is. And basically, it's something that misleads or distracts. And then he provides this very general idea that conspiracy theories can be used to infiltrate the truth movement or the community of people that are searching for truth. Now we're at a minute and 46 seconds, which is halfway into his video. He hasn't even discussed mud flood yet, but he's suggesting that these conspiracy theories can erase your history, your heritage, culture, and even you. And he's suggesting that the mud flood is an attack on European peoples through ethnic diversity. I'll pause here to explain my thoughts on this. I'm not saying that he's right or he's wrong, but I will say that he has given no evidence, no explanation, no proof as to how ethnic diversity is at all connected to mud flood. He has not explained himself, and I think he has failed to make any connection. Then he references Alex Jones, and now he's talking about some kind of white genocide of people. These are all different issues, but my point is, is that he has not even touched upon the subject of mud flood. He has not addressed it. He has not explained it. If you haven't seen Mud Flood videos before, watching his videos, you'll have no idea what he's talking about. To me, creating a YouTube video and proving an argument is a lot like writing an essay. So I looked up an image on Google Images that shows a flowchart on how to write an essay. And it basically is broken down like this. 
you have a point or thing you're trying to prove, the point of view you intend to express, and then you provide logical examples. Once you provide logical examples and you address counter arguments and other things, then you can draw a conclusion on that basis. That is how you construct an argument. That's how you write an essay, and I think when you go into court and you build a case for something, you are addressing claims in the case of civil court or charges in the case of a criminal court, and you have to build a case with logical proof, which really is your evidence, and then draw a conclusion on that basis. I will admit that even in my own videos in the past, I might have been sloppy. I may not have actually followed a logical progression of ideas. I think I tend to, but I might not be perfect. But my point is this. In this video by the Mad Dr. S, he has not followed any type of logical process for building an argument against mud flood. He has defined what a psychological operation is. He has defined a red herring. He has kind of explained what a conspiracy theory is. And he's talked about unrelated things like Alex Jones and the demographics of the United States, to put it politely. Has he talked about mud flood? No, he has not. Maybe it is petty of me to try and address a video that only has 434 views, but I do get a little concerned when someone's coming out and accusing the mud flood of being some type of hoax and further creating a video which, in my opinion, is very bad at providing any kind of logical argument for or against the mud flood. Obviously, the mud flood is something I've expressed in my own videos. So if someone came along and created a logical argument against the mud flood, I should actually be thankful that that person went to the trouble of doing that. You should be thankful for your critics. It, it helps you reinforce your own beliefs. It helps you question your own beliefs. And so I totally support any criticism of mud flood. If you want to call it a hoax, that's okay too. But you better have a proper argument to explain why it's a hoax. And I'd like to take this a little further. Another thing I would like to say is that the mud flood phenomenon, cultural layer, whatever you'd like to call it, is not, the mud flood is not a conspiracy theory. It's not a conspiracy theory. It doesn't seek to accuse a hidden government of conspiring. I mean, I suppose I could look up the definition of what a conspiracy is or a conspiracy theory is. My point is this, mud flood is an examination of facts, of circumstantial evidence regarding old buildings and a muddy cultural layer that has developed at the base of the foundation of buildings. That's an examination of the physical world, physical science. That's not a conspiracy. You might be able to say the flat earth is a conspiracy sooner than you can accuse the mud flood of being that. Because I think the flat earth is a little bit harder to prove. Because how can you travel into space and take pictures? You can't do that. There are ways to discern the surface of the Earth, the curvature. You can, you can look at the ocean. You can see that it's flat, it's level. And you can also look at official explanation as to how the Earth curves. And you can look at a landscape of space and you can determine how far you should be able to see. Given the official explanation for a curvature, you should be able to demonstrate this by looking through telescopes and looking at landscapes and for example I live in Hamilton Ontario according to the Earth's curvature I don't think I should be able to see the CN Tower in Toronto but on a clear day from Hamilton you can see the CN Tower in Toronto or from St. Catharines if you look at a map or according to the official explanations of the Earth's curvature and what it should be you shouldn't be able to see into the distance now that stands to have a, a separate proper argument made for it but my point is say to compare the flat earth phenomenon with the mud flood phenomenon, I think you will have a better opportunity to explain the mud flood than you even would flat earth. That didn't come out so well. But my point is, this is not a conspiracy theory. This is using logic and looking at circumstantial evidence. Old buildings have been inundated with dirt. There are thousands of examples worldwide. It's illogical that anybody would design a building with entranceways and windows only to be buried underground, and yet there's a preponderance of buildings that seemingly have been built this way. 
And further, just as another argument, brick is not something you should submerge below ground level. Now you might actually say there's a level, layer of stucco on top of the brick here, but brick really doesn't weather very well when it's buried below ground. That's why new buildings are built with cast concrete. They don't even use blocks so much anymore, like cinder blocks. They use precast concrete in a lot of instances to keep a seal, and the concrete weathers way better than brick does. Builders know this. That's why they don't build brick houses at a foundational level. They don't put bricks underground. Or why there's no popular knowledge of the mud flood. History books and the historical record do not make mention of the mud flood. So I suppose based on that, then I suppose you could say that somebody at a high level has conspired to keep this knowledge hidden from the general population. However, evidence, which unfortunately is circumstantial rather than direct, evidence does exist that a mud flood has occurred. I think that if it was tried in court, the judge would have to admit that a mud flood historically has happened. So I have taken the time in this video that you're watching to try and articulate an argument to show that given it had to go to court, a mud flood is provable to have happened given the circumstantial evidence that we see all around the world. I'm not covering anything new that hasn't been presented before. But what I'd like to point out is an area where I think a lot of people get confused. Because when you start watching a lot of these videos on mud flood, the first question that comes to your mind is how did this happen? How did this happen? And how come we don't have anything seemingly in our history that gives account for a mud flood phenomenon happening? How come there's no explanation for this? There are, in fact, some historical floods that are accounted for in history. Here's one example, and this was a pretty big flood. It affected a large geographical area from Oregon down to Mexico. So there actually is historical precedent for this happening, or something like a mud flood event. But admittedly, what is lacking is direct evidence. Direct evidence would be, say, somebody who gave an account in a local newspaper who experienced this flood and then in explicit detail explained how the foundation of numerous buildings were inundated with dirt and soil. This picture actually almost speaks to that, but so far as I can tell, you can't find a History Channel documentary which explains this or popular books written on this. And to provide a proof for that statement, I'd like to point out that when you go to Wikipedia and you type in mud flood, the very first entry says the page mud flood does not yet exist. You can ask for it to be created, but consider checking the search results below to see whether the topic is already covered. Well, I could sort through all of this, but right away it doesn't look like it's covered. Especially when a lot of popular ideas on YouTube videos discussing mud flood tend to suggest some type of mud flood event that may have happened in the 1850s, earlier, later, somewhere around there. But I'm pointing this out because I think this is really what confuses most people when they start looking into mud flood, is that there's nothing that really substantiates the direct evidence that they see for mud flood. And thus, people tend to conclude that there's some type of conspiracy to hide the truth about our history our history here on Earth, for everybody on Earth. This is in Africa. This is in Europe. This is in Korea. This is in Canada, North America. I forget where this is, but I think it was in South America. I think this is Peru, I'm not sure. My point is as follows even getting away from mud flood and just looking at conventional history and architecture worldwide it can be seen that a similar style of architecture can be found worldwide earthwide complete with similar style columns that's one detail that really jumps out at me like the ionic doric corinthian composite all the other columns these columns appear on buildings all over the earth so we can only conclude that every culture on earth was building buildings with a similar style of architecture. But we know that people around the earth are different. There's different types of people, different cultures, different languages. And yet the architectural style is the same. 
So here's just another proof, aside from the mud flood, that the history we have does not seem to reflect how unified the architectural styles are all over the earth. Thus, this leads me and a lot of other people to question whether we really understand our true history. Uh, I'm going to be a little bit more blunt. The mud flood, historical architecture, the problems we've been seeing with the pervasiveness of this similar style of architecture worldwide, and the mud flood phenomenon, what it indicates, I will say it bluntly. It tends to indicate that the history we have, which does not mention these things, the history we have might be fabricated. It might be a lie. It throws into question that we evolved from monkeys two trillion years ago. It seems that something cataclysmic probably happened more realistically about 200 years ago. I'm not sure how else to show it, but I'd just like to show that I'm not the only one saying this, and in fact this idea has become very popular, and even dangerous. Well, all I can say are that these are exciting times, and ideas like mud flood and architecture and everything else that goes with it is gaining momentum, and I'm thankful to see somebody becoming this popular. It's pretty amazing. Okay, so I think I'll leave it at that. So thanks for listening, and have a good day. Take care.